So, uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Rez Mani and I'm an application scientist with Afri Allied Scientific Pro. And this is our second uh, webinar out of uh, uh, three webinars. And we already had our webinar one about two months ago. This is our second one and there will be a third one. Uh, so, my email address is written in front of this uh, H R Manny at AlliedScientificPro.com. Since you have access to this uh, uh, presentation, you can feel free to to email me uh, if there are any any questions or any concerns. Uh, after the webinar, you feel free to ask me any questions. You can type your questions, and also there will be a quiz of 20 questions that uh, will be sent to you. So you can do those quiz. Uh, questions and uh, see what you uh, marks to get and if there are any any uh, concerns or uh, questions about those you can also email me in the last webinar number one uh, we covered some topics such as the electromagnetic spectrum the photon energy wave properties of electromagnetic spectrum the range of uh, this spectrum from UV to IR and also we talked about uh, uh, not in depth but we just sort of touched on the CIE diagrams and, uh, and the, the CRI index, the color temperature and also some conversion between photometric and radiometric units. Now in this seminar level two, we are going to go more in depth into some of these topics. And here are the outline, here are the, the topics I'll be talking about. First, I'll talk about solid angle uh, because it is used in the units that are for both photometry and, and radiometry. Uh, so we need to understand what solid angle is. Uh, and then we we'll talk about the relation between photometric and radiometric quantities. And then we move on to chromaticity coordinates 1931, 1960, and 1976. And we will examine this in detail. Uh, we didn't examine it in detail last time. We just showed it. But uh, this time we are going to actually explain how we can calculate these chromaticity coordinates. Then we talk about the calculation of color rendering index, the CRI index, and then the dominant wavelength purity are two other parameters. These are all measured by lighting passport, by the way. In case you have a unit and you use it, you've probably seen these parameters, uh, dominant wavelength purity, CRI, and so it's good to know uh, what are these. And then uh, we will talk about some limitations of the, uh, the CRI method of color rendering. And, uh, and then uh, we will talk about the new standard IES-TM 30-15 standard. And why is that a better standard as compared to the CIE uh, CRI method? By the way, I want to say the CIE stands for uh, it's the French name, so Commission uh, uh, Internationale de Éclairage. That's the name. That's the acronym for CIE, which is the governing body for for uh, colorimetry. And the IES is the North American uh, branch of it, which is the uh, International and uh, uh, Illuminations Illumination. International Engineering or Illumination Engineering Society of North America. That's what it is. Illumination Engineering Society. So IES is a branch of CIE in a way. So this standard is not completely followed by everyone, but it has many advantages. So we'll go through that uh, and compare it with the CIE 1931, 1960, 1976. And then finally, we will talk about one practical example of measuring color temperature uh, using lighting passport and why is that important? Uh, why a lot of people these days are, are uh, uh, inclined to purchase LEDs and in some ways they're right because 
they are have a very low consumption. They last much longer, and they provide good quality. But uh, I want to mention that these are uh, the color temperature is also a very important factor. So for different situations, one has to choose the proper color temperature. I give you a proper example or one example of how this was done in a house and uh, how the color temperature has made a difference. Okay, let's move on. So let's uh, start with solid angle. So solid angle is this cone that is subtended between a point and intersecting surface, uh, surface of the sphere. So if you consider the center of this sphere and if you draw a cone uh, from the center, it would, uh, it would intersect the surface of the sphere and uh, at this surface area we call it A. So the definition of solid angle is A divided by a square of the radius and this represents the cone. The cone, this angle is, represents the how big is the cone or how small is the cone. And uh, why are we interested in this? Because whenever we are, uh, we are looking at a light that is shining from a light source, we want to know in which cone this light is traveling. So A over R squared is, has a symbol of omega and it's called the solid angle and its unit is the steradian or for short SR. So let us keep this in mind for the future units that we'll be talking about. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between photometric and radiometric quantities. And I have uh, listed these on this uh, chart. On the left side, you have the radiometric quantities. And on the right side, you have the photometric quantities. So keep in mind that the difference between the radiometric and photometric is that Radiometric concerns with all the spectrum. It doesn't matter where, IR, UV, uh, X-ray, anywhere. Uh, however, the photometric uh, quantities uh, take into account the eye response function and the visible range, which is from 400 to 700 nanometer. So to calculate from a radiometric unit to a photometric unit, you have to take into account the I response function. So first we can just see here you have the radium power or in units of watt uh, and the symbol phi E and its corresponding unit in photometry is luminous flux or luminous power in lumen and its unit is phi V. So anytime we have a radiometric unit its subscript is E and anytime we have a photometric unit is subscript is B. Next we have radian intensity in the units of watt per steradian and a steradian is a solid angle that I described in the previous slide and uh, the symbol is IE. It corresponds to luminous intensity which is lumen per steradian or we also call it candela, IV. And if you want to picture candela, how intense is a candela? It's roughly the intensity of a candle. So, uh, you know, by comparing intensity of different sources uh, with uh, intensity of a normal candle, you can say how many candelas there are. So, for example, the high beam of a car could be 300 candelas or 3,000 candelas, something like that. But an LED on a chipboard it could be 0 0.05 candelas. So this is how we can compare these. Now irradiance uh, is watts per meter square, is the units watts per meter square, and its symbol EE, it corresponds to illuminance in the unit of lumen per meter square. And we call lumen per meter square lux. And if you have used the lighting passport, you would know that you know it always gives you the illuminance units in, in lux. So you make a measurement of the intensity of a light source, it will tell you how many lux it is. And finally, you have radius in the unit of watt per meter square per steradian, symbol LE, and its corresponding unit in photometry is luminance, lumen per meter square per steradian. 
but we already know that lumen first radian is candela, so it will be candela per meter square. So this is a one-to-one -one correspondence between these, these units, and we are going to go through each one of them and explain each one. So, as I was mentioning, every time you want to convert between a photometric and radiometric unit, you have to take into account the I response function. So, I response function in this equation, which is an integral, is represented by V of lambda. And you can see its shape here. It has a maximum at 555 nanometers. So, that's the peak sensitivity of our eye, which happens to be the maximum uh, intense wavelength of the sun. So, the peak wavelength of the sun is 555 nanometer. It's a black body radiation. And hence, our eyes through millions of years have evolved to, to, to have a peak sensitivity of 555 nanometers. And then it just falls down when it goes to 400 on one side and 700 on the other side. Uh, so, for converting any uh, radiometric unit, which has a subscript E, to a photometric unit, subscript E, we have to evaluate this integral. So this QE could be radians, could be radians, could be uh, intensity, or could be uh, power, uh, and then whatever quantity. And then you just plug it into this equation, and uh, then KM is a constant, which is equal to 683 lumen per watt. And then you can find the value of the photometric, corresponding photometric unit. Now, the interesting thing is that if your uh, spectrum is monochromatic, meaning that it has only one wavelength, and if that wavelength is 555 nanometer, for example, if you want to uh, look at the radiant power and your source is at 555 nanometer, it has only one wavelength, then it turns out that this integral becomes equal to 1. As you can see, the maximum here is 1. And therefore, you just get this factor Km, which is 683 lumen per watt. So, this is 1 watt, and this is 683 lumen per watt. So, then the corresponding uh, quantity in photometric units, or uh, uh, we call it the luminous power, would be 683 lumen. So you can say at 555 nanometer, one watt would correspond to 683 lumen. But if you have a spectrum, then you have to evaluate this integral. So next, uh, I'm just going to go through each one. Radiant power, luminous flux or power. So you can see I substituted phi E here for uh, radiant power. And this is basically just the amount of uh, photons or light that is emitted from a lamp. That's the radiant power. And uh, you can calculate the corresponding luminous flux there. Next is the radiant intensity, watts per radian. Uh, so again, we have this integral. Uh, so to explain this more, what is that is we are concerned in radiant intensity in the amount of light that is uh, propagating through a certain cone. So if in this cone, which has a solid angle of uh, delta omega, there is this intensity or there is this power of delta phi, then I would be equal to delta phi over delta omega. This is the definition of I. So you can also picture if you have a light source and then you have a detector at a distance r, then you have your uh, solid angle that is subtended by this detector is A, which is the area of the detector over R squared. And uh, uh, if, if you remember for the definition of solid angle, we said it's the surface on a part of the sphere. But you can approximate if A is much smaller than R squared, you can consider this A to be flat, basically. So you can just calculate the surface of this uh, uh, of this detector. Uh, so this is a definition of radiant intensity and its relation to luminous intensity. 
Next is irradiance or illuminance. And I've substituted E of E lambda, which is the irradiance in this equation, and integrating from 400 to 700 nanometer, finding the illuminance in the units of lumen per meter square or lux. So what is illuminance or irradiance? It is the amount of light that is falling on the surface and is illuminating a particular area. So if the surface delta A shown here is illuminated by a uh, light power of delta phi E, then E of E, which is the irradiance, is delta phi E over delta A. So A E is the irradiance and phi E is the radiant power. The following relation can also be derived between irradiance E E and radiance I E. So let's look at this relation. There's a new relation that is at the bottom here. So if E E is delta phi E over delta A, uh, we already know that delta phi is related to radiant intensity by I E delta omega. And we can also say that uh, delta, sorry, yeah. So we can also say that delta A uh, over delta omega would be equal to 1 over R squared. So we can substitute here. So if you remember, we said that uh, delta A over R squared is, is delta omega. So uh, delta A over R squared is delta. So instead of delta A, we could write delta omega R squared and delta omega cancels. So you end up getting I E over R squared. So between irradiance and radiant intensity, there's also the relation that Irradiance equal to radiant intensity divided by square of the, uh, the, the radius. Radius meaning the radius of this, this surface. Uh, sorry, radius means the distance. Radius means the distance in here. So next one is uh, radiance, the relation between radiance and luminance. Radiance in the unit of watt per meter square to radian and luminance in the unit of candela per meter square. And again, we're subbing Le here in the same general equation and integrating from 400 to 700 to get our, our luminance. So what is luminance How we or radiance? How do we define that? So suppose this surface here, which is shown on the left-hand side, is, our, uh, is shining light. That is the bright surface then uh, we are concerned about the amount of light that propagates through this small cone delta phi and uh, this uh, delta A is the surface area here that is, that is providing this light, the tiny surface area delta A and delta omega is the solid angle of this cone and cos theta is the angle between the normal to the uh, to this uh, um, elemental surface area and, and the direction of propagation. So if it is, you're looking at it along this direction, then the theta would be here. And this would be the equation that would uh, define the, the luminance. Sorry, the, this would be the, radi the radiance equation, delta phi over cos theta delta A delta omega. And a similar thing, you can, once you have this, you can plug in the previous equation and calculate the luminance. So these are some basic photometric quantities and units. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to remember all of these, but if you ever come across these units or these quantities, you can always refer to this presentation and just remember what it is. Normally, when you're using lighting passport, we are mostly concerned with irradiance. So we, we like to use the unit of lux to measure illuminance on the surface. And even for horticultural applications, we want to know lux. And we also want to know something called PPFD, which is photosynthetic photon flux density, which is the number of photons per meter square per second. So uh, these two parameters are important. So uh, I don't see much application for a lighting passport that uses radiance or 
uh, well, radian intensity in candela, also good to know about it. Okay, next. Let's move on to another topic right now. Uh, the 1931 chromaticity coordinates. So those of you who have used the lighting passport know that when you make a measurement, you always see this diagram that appears there and it has this boundary, it has so many different colors in it and there's this black curve in there which shows the black body radiation at different temperatures. And there are also these perpendicular lines at different temperatures. So we want to understand what is this chromaticity coordinates? What do these numbers mean and where they come from? And how do they calculate it? These are all the questions. So let me explain this. Uh, so first of all, there is two coordinates. There's the X coordinate and Y coordinate. So any light source, when you make a measurement, will, will have a coordinate and fall somewhere in this, uh, in this curve, uh, which looks like, a, like an oval-shaped curve. And then there are some properties of this. The boundaries of this curve, they all correspond to monochromatic light. So you can see 480, 490, 500, 520, 540, 560, and so on. So, for example, if you get a, a, a helium neon laser, then your, your point would fall here, 632 nanometers. Or if you get uh, another laser like a, uh, like a YAG laser, you'll find, you'll find its way somewhere around 1065, 32 nanometers. It will be around here. It will be on the boundary. But if your source is a mixture of colors, then it will fall somewhere here, somewhere in between. So here, for example, you can just see that this dot represents that this source that we measured was a black body because it's falling exactly on this black body curve. And its color temperature is 8,000 K. Now, uh, what else? These lines basically also show that if you, your source is not exactly a black, a black body, it falls like above or below, then you can just use these perpendicular lines to find the correlated color temperature. So although they're not exactly a black body, they have uh, the same color temperature and we call it correlated color temperature. So for example, if the source falls here, on where I'm pointing the mouse, you can just, uh, uh, or on this one, you can just bring it here and say this is about 8,000. It's falling on this line that is intersecting the curve at 8,000 Kelvin. So that would be the, 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 the color, correlated color temperature of this, uh, this source. So how do we calculate this? The question is, where do these numbers come from? So you point the uh, lighting passport at a light and it gives you chromaticity coordinates, but why and how these numbers are calculated? This is the question. So you can see the scale here from 0 to 1 or 0.9 and from 0 to 0.8. So uh, how these numbers are calculated. So I want to go through this because I think it's important to understand how this chromaticity coordinate is calculated. So uh, our eyes have three types of cones. Uh, so there's red cone, there's a green cone, and there's a blue cone. So corresponding to each cone, we have uh, these uh, X bar, Y bar, Z bar. They are the color matching functions. And they're shown in here. So this is your red one. This is the color matching function for red one. And this is for the green, and this is for the blue. So once you make a measurement with lighting passport, it measures F lambda, which is the power distribution of the light. And then it will calculate, sorry, it will calculate this through this integral, S lambda, X lambda to D lambda. So these, ignore these uh, uh, limits of the integral. They should be from 400 to 700. So Km is our uh, constant, which was 683 lumen per watt. And therefore, we can, through the evaluating, evalu through evaluating these three integrals, we get X capital X capital Y capital Z, which I'll call the tri-stimulus values. So once we have X capital X capital Y capital Z, 
uh, then we would measure, we would calculate the chromaticity coordinate through these relations. Uh, so you can read it, x over x plus y plus z and so on. And the important factor is that z, the third chromaticity coordinate, is related to x and y by 1 minus x plus y. So once you have x and y, you automatically know what z is. And that explains that why we show the chromaticity coordinate on a two-dimensional diagram, not a three-dimensional diagram, because the third chromaticity coordinate, z, can be automatically calculated from x and y. So this is how we uh, get those uh, chromaticity coordinates. Now, there has been some transformation, some new um, CIE diagrams, for example, this is a 1960 diagram. There have been some modifications. I'll explain it to you in the next slide. Uh, but for this one, just remember that the, uh, the, 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 the two chromaticity uh, values will change to U and V through some transformations. And, so, and we'll be using this later on when we're talking about the uh, IES TM 30-15. So this is another uh, chromaticity diagram, 1960. And then we also have 1976, which you see in Lighting Passport. And it looks slightly different. So for this one, some transformations are done, which are shown in here, u prime equal to 4x minus, divided by minus 2x plus 12y plus 3, and v prime equal to 9y over minus 2x plus 12y plus 3. So you take your xy coordinates and then you do this transformation and then you ge generate this new diagram. So why was there a need to generate a new diagram and what is the difference between this diagram and the previous diagram? So ex the ex formal explanation is that 1976 has the advantage that the distance between points is approximately proportional to the perceived color difference, something that is not true in case of 1931 diagram. So let me explain this. This is not so easy to understand when you read it first. So if you compare this diagram, 1976, with the previous diagram, which is the 1931, one thing that you would notice is that you would notice that the green areas here are much broader uh, and then as compared to the red and blue. Red and blue are smaller in this one. But if you go to this one, you see the, the green is smaller and red and blues are larger. So it's as if uh, the, the green area has shrunk and the, uh, the green and the blue and red areas have expanded. And this means that uh, this is due to the fact that our eye sensitivity is maximum in the green area. So if you move by a few nanometers in the green-yellow region, you can distinguish a color dis difference. Our eyes would distinguish a color difference in the green-blue area. But if you are in the red region or in the blue region, you have to move by a, by a much more um, uh, uh, difference in wavelength before we can distinguish a color difference. And therefore here you can just see because the green is smaller, here's the meaning of this. The distance between points is approximately proportional to the perceived color difference. If you are in the green area, you have to move a very small area, very small distance to perceive a color difference. But if you are in the red area, you have to move a much higher uh, distance or much larger distance to perceive a color difference. So that's why it says that this diagram is more uniform and is more corresponding to our eye response because our eye response is more sensitive in the green and yellow region. So, so a small uh, shift in wavelength would uh, be distinguishable by our eyes. So that was the reason for 1976. So now let's go to calculation of color rendering index. In the previous webinar, we just said what color in rendering index is. We never said how are we going to get these numbers, how we calculate them. 
So like, just to refresh your memory, uh, I showed this diagram in the previous webinar, uh, the picture of four apples. Starting from left uh, to right, you see the color is being washed out. So the left one has nice natural colors, look really red, natural. And as you move on to the right, the, the, the color wash is washed out, it becomes dimmer. And here CRI index 97 for the left one, then 90, then 80, then 70. So basically this CRI index represents the how natural a color of an object shows under a certain light source as compared to a natural light source. So if you put an uh, apple under the sun, which is a natural light source, the black body at, at around 5,700 Kelvin, it shows its perfect color. But if you put the same apple under some kind of sodium lamp, you can't see that red color the way it is. So that means that the, um, the CRI index of uh, that lamp is much lower and the CRI index of the sun or an incandescent lamp would be almost 100. So the question is, let's look at this quantitatively and how we calculate these numbers, 97, 90, 80, and 70. What is the method of doing that? So here are the steps of doing that. So step number one, find the chromaticity coordinate of the light source in 1931. So I, I explained how you do that, you make a measurement, you find the spectral power distribution and then calculate those integrals and find x and y. Then from the diagram find the correlated color temperature. Then depending on where the point falls, you can, uh, you can find the correlated color temperature and see if that is less than 5,000 Kelvin or more than 5,000 Kelvin. If it is less than 5,000 Kelvin, you can choose a reference black body source at the same temperature. And if it is more than 5,000 Kelvin, you can choose another uh, uh, source, which is called the CIE, Standard Illuminant D. Remember CIE was that governing body for colorimetry uh, that I talked about. And uh, this is the, the shape of this standard illuminant D. Now, why they have made this, this distinction, I don't know. But this is the standard method that they use. And then what we'll do is you would illuminate eight standard samples, colors. They're called test color samples, or TCS, from R1 to R8. And I've shown them right down here. You would illuminate these with your black body source or your reference source and get the reflection, get the chromaticity of the reflection and then you also illuminate them with the, uh, your test source and, and then measure, measure the reflection, find the chromaticity of the reflection. And uh, then after that you would do a transform from 1931 to 1960 uh, so remember, I showed you the 1960 diagram, which was here, its coordinates were U, V. So you would do that um, because human vision adapts to various illumination conditions by shifting colors, and that's a more appropriate uh, uh, scale for measuring these, uh, these coordinates. Uh, so you have to apply these uh, chromatic uh, adaptation corrections, and then there is, if the source is not like a black body, there is a difference, there's a distance, like on the chromaticity coordinates, on the UV diagram, you see that the reflected source, the, the test source and, uh, uh, and the reference source, they fall on different points, they do not coincide. And let's call those co uh, coordinates U1, V1 and U2, V2. Say U1, V1 is for the reflected light, from the uh, test source and U2V2 is the reflected light from the reference source. So you would calculate the Euclidean distance which is defined by this equation, basically the distance between the two, uh, the two points. And uh, calculate that and then 
you would plug into this equation 100 minus 4.6 times delta EI, where I equal to 1 over A, 1 to 8. So you would calculate different indices, R1 to R8. And then you would average them out. In step 9, you would average them out. And RA, which is your CRI index, is just the average of RI to R8. And this is the number that you get. That is the number that you get. And if your source is exactly a black body, the delta, delta EI would be zero, and your uh, uh, CRI index would be 100. If there is a large distance delta EI, then your CRI index would be small. So uh, this is how you calculate it. Now, you can also extend this by adding six more saturated colors and then do this for 15 colors instead of eight colors, and then calculate the index RE. So you would uh, see this RE in the uh, lighting password also. So once you do a uh, measurement, it will give you both R, uh, R A and RE. It will also give you the individual values for each of those colors, each of those indices. So this is the method that we use for uh, CIE color rendering. And this is again how you calculate, depending on where the point falls, you calculate what is its color temperature using these, uh, you can say, isothermal lines in a way, these perpendicular lines. So next, let's look at DUV and dominant wavelength. What is DUV and dominant wavelength? So referring to the left diagram, the, when you do the measurement, again here is the 1960 diagram, UV are the two axes. DUV it provides information on the distance and direction of a color shift from the Planckian locus on the 1960 UV coordinate. So when DUV is closer to zero, the light source is more like an ideal one, like it's more like a black body. So if it falls farther away, on top of this black body curve, then its DUV is larger. If it falls below it, uh, and its DUV is, is, uh, uh, could be negative, it is above it, could be positive, or it is positive, it is below it, it is negative, and it could be, depending on distance, it could be larger or smaller. So here you have DUV plus 0 0.02, plus 0 0.01, on the line, it will DUV of zero, below the line, minus 0 0.01, minus 0 0.02. So this is the UV. Another parameter given by lighting passport. Then you also have the dominant wavelength. Uh, what is the dominant wavelength? So you can see in this diagram that E is, uh, is actually a reference source and its chromaticity is 0.33 and 0.33. It has equal X and Y, or U and, uh, yeah, X and Y chromaticity, uh, 0.33 and 0.33. So you make a measurement of your source, and let's say that source is F and falls over here, uh, point F. It has a different chromaticity, say in this case it's about maybe 0.48 and 0.5, something like that. And then you connect E, point E to F, and extend it such that it would, uh, intersect the boundary of the CIE diagram, uh, it will cut it at or intersect it at a particular wavelength. And this is that wavelength which we call lambda dominant. So this way you, you connect E to F and extend it all the way up till it intersects the boundary of this, this figure. And the wavelength where it is intersected, that would be the dominant wavelength. So basically, it will tell you the source of light that you're using, what is the wavelength that is uh, most important in it. And, uh, you know, it could contain many different ones, many different colors, but there may be one that is dominant or prevailing wavelength, and that is the dominant wavelength. Now, what about purity? This is another, another factor. So purity, if you look at this diagram, it is the ratio of the blue line to red line divided by, in multiplied by 100%. So once again, you would uh, count, you take the ratio of EF 
which is the distance between the reference and the test source, and uh, to E lambda, which is the diff distance between the reference and where it intersects the boundary. And that will give you the, the purity uh, when you multiply by 100. Notice that if a source is monochromatic, so it is, it is only one wavelength, then this point F is very, very close to the boundary if it is monochromatic. And therefore, the purity would be almost 100%. So purity is also defined as this PE YF minus Y0 over YD minus Y0. So what are these parameters? YF is obviously the coordinate, the Y coordinate of, of F, which is our test point. And uh, YD is the dominant, the Y of our dominant wavelength. And uh, Y0 is the coordinates of our reference point, which is E. So it's also equal to XF minus X0 over XT minus X0. And why is this true? Because as we defined it here, the blue over red, it's just like the blue over red. It's the uh, it's this side of the is the uh, this this part of the triangle, the OD, right? So it is OB over OD is similar to blue over red, and that is by law of similar triangles uh, is equal to uh, OA over OC or AB over CD. So this relation comes from the laws of uh, triangles, similar triangles. So this way you can calculate the purity of a, of a light source. All right, next. TM3015 standard. So what is this standard and what is the, what is the need for this? So uh, if you were looking at the CIE, uh, color rendering index, uh, you would only uh, measure the fidelity of light. So you can only say a particular light source, how far away from a natural source it is. You can't quantify the chroma. You can't say if it has, it's more saturated or less saturated. You could just say that it has the chromaticity of 70. So it is 30% away from an ideal light source or a black body light source. And these pictures clearly show that. You can see on the left side the original picture of the park with the park bench and trees. And then you also have um, this picture, the desaturated picture, fade colors, RA of 70. And this one is highly saturated picture, also RA of 70. So the CIE, CIE color rendering uh, standard, which gives you RA, does not tell you the difference between these two. It will just give you an RA of 70. And that's not good because CRA, CRI is an average value, which is only a measure of fidelity. And uh, the other problem with the uh, uh, CRI is that it uses a limited number of test color samples, which are only eight, and that do not represent the world today, uh, the real world. So we have much broader uh, variations of colors, and eight colors will not do it for us. So uh, TM3015 standards, which has uh, been proposed by the IES, the Illumination Engineering Society, North American branch of CIE, has uh, introduced this new unit. And uh, this one, uh, first of all, has 99 test color samples. And instead of just the RA, which is the color rendering index, it has two indices. They're called RF and RG. RF represents fidelity, is on a scale of 1 to 100. And RG represents chroma, its value normal changes between 60 to 140. So for example, in this picture, you can probably say, all right, with the, TI, with the TM3015, this would be an RF of 70, but RG of 140. 
Oh, sorry, RG of 70. So R A R R F of 70 and R G of 70. But this one would be R F of 70 with R G of 130. So this way you could distinguish between the two uh, that have the same fidelity but different chromas. Uh, so this is one advantage of that. Now, RG values above 100 show saturated colors, values less than 100 show desaturation. Uh, the other big advantage of TM3015 is that it has better graphical representation. Uh, so the graphical representation of TM30 would give you a lot of information about how colors have shifted and how they are different from a black body source. So, what is the procedure to calculate RF and RG in TM30-15? Let us look at that. Uh, so first of all, again, I'll quickly go through this. Once again, 1931 chromaticity coordinates are calculated, and then the CCT of test sources determined from the chromaticity diagram. Then uh, depending on the color, whether it's more than, depending on the uh, color temperature, whether it's more than 5,000, less than 5,000, uh, a reference source is chosen, and this time instead of the eight samples, 99 samples are illuminated by the test source and reference source, and the reflection is measured, the chromaticity of the reflection is measured, and there are some transformations are done using this CAM02-UCS, it's, uh, it's some kind of uh, mathematical engine, uh, so we're not going through the details of that. And uh, you will see in this diagram that this uh, diagram is generated after the transformation. Its axes have coordinates A prime, B prime. Uh, the red dots correspond to the test source, and the black dots correspond to the reference source. So there are 99 of these. There are 99 black dots and 99 red dots, depending on the reflection from each of those colors. So what we would do is we would just calculate the Euclidean distance, a prime minus a prime, a prime one minus a prime two whole square plus b prime one minus b prime two whole square square root for each of these pairs. And then we would have r1 to r99, and then we would calculate, sorry, we would calculate the Euclidean distance for these 99 and calculate R1 to R99, R1 to R99 through this equation, 100 minus 4.6 delta EI. And then the RF, or the fidelity index, is the average of the 99 values of RI, rather than eight values. So that's a big advantage. It uses much broader uh, variety of colors to calculate the color rendering, not only just eight. Now, to calculate the RG value, what we will do is we would divide up this diagram into 16 uh, slices, like a pizza, for example. How you can divide it many slices. So this, we divide this pizza shape into 16 slices, and each angle is 22 and a half degrees. And then we would average out all the black dots uh, and at all the red dots. So, so we get a number for average of all black dots that are in that slice and, and another average for all the red dots which are in that slice. And then we will join them together. And then we come up with these two diagrams here. The black one represents the uh, test source, I believe, no, the reference source and the dotted red one represents the, uh, the test source. And the RG is calculated by finding the ratio of these polygons, uh, so the test polygon over the uh, reference polygon multiplied by 100. So this test polygon area could be larger or could be smaller, depending on the light source. So that's why there is no limit of 100 for the RG index, it could be more than 100, it could be less than 100. So typically values are between 60 to 100. So uh, if it is less than 100, it shows desaturation. If it shows, if more than 100, it shows saturation. So here you can see 
again, um, I was just explaining black and red. This I explained already. So you can normalize the, the test the reference source to a circle. So make it uh, make all the values just divide them by, by its own, make it make it a circle of a certain radius, and then divide the test source by the same number so you get a value which is a slightly different. So here you can see the the black one is like the reference and the red one is the test. So normally you will see this diagram in Lighting Passport also. The reference is being normalized to a circle. And then this is how the other one would look like. So uh, this is a color vector graphic that uh, this new standard has that the CIE, CRI method does not have. Now there, there will be the, the RG versus RF diagrams and there's a corresponding between this diagram and this color diagram. So in this case, you can see the test source and the reference source are both a circle. They're perfect black bodies. So therefore, you can see you get the value, the dot here, or a circle here that has RF of 100 and RG of 100 also. So this is uh, exactly a black body. But in this one, you will see that our test source has an area which is bigger than the circle. Circle is the reference, and this uh, sort of irregular shape uh, is our test source. So its area is much bigger, so it has saturation. So you can see in this case, uh, its RG is about 115 here, and its RF is something like 65. So whenever you have the the shape of the test source is not a circle. Your RF cannot be 100. RF should definitely be less than 100. In fact, for all practical light sources, they fall within this triangle. So it's not possible to have a, a, a source that falls here or here or, or it cannot be like on this line. It has to fall within this. When the shape of the, the source varies from a circle, RF changes but then RG could be more or less than 100. So here's another example where you can see our test source has a smaller area as compared to a reference source. So that means it's a desaturated, um, uh, shows this case of desaturation. So its value RG is about 85, and its RF is about 65. So it's a very uh, useful method to quantify saturation and desaturation. And by the way, I want to mention that necessarily, not necessarily, this is the best case. Because in certain applications, you want to have uh, like saturation or desaturation. So for example, if you are in an amusement park, you want to have more saturation uh, because you want the colors to show really bright and saturated. So, so this does not necessarily mean that because this one has lower fidelity, this is not a good light source. And this one is a good light source. That's not the case. It depends on the application. All right, finally, we come to our last uh, topic here, uh, real measurement of color temperature from three different light sources in the house. So I was mentioning that there's a lot of enthusiasm about purchasing LEDs these days. And they are mostly true. Uh, LEDs are great light sources. They're very efficient. And they are also, um, uh, they last much longer. And they provide good illumination. And they're very cheap also. So why not? Why not save electricity bill on electricity bill? But uh, here is an example that also other factors have to be considered. So one of my friends uh, has a house and has a number of tenants in the house. And to reduce his electric bill, he purchased uh, a number of LED, LED lamps, like here in the middle, and replaced all the uh, compact fluorescent lamps already in the rooms by the LED. And uh, the tenants were not happy with the change because they said that this LED light is too, too white. Basically, the room looks like a hospital. And they can't relax at night. When they go home and they want to relax at night, they can't because the room is too white. 
although the price was very cheap and uh, the consumption of LED is slightly less than the compact fluorescent lamp. So he asked me to come and do some measurements with the lighting passport, and I did. So when I did the measurements, there was also tube LEDs in the house. So what I found that the, the previous lights, the compact fluorescent light, is yellowish color. Its color temperature was 2700K. It's called the warm fluorescent. The LED, on the other hand, had 4820K. It's actually written on the box. It was written as a daylight, daylight uh, uh, LED. So it is as if you went in the middle of the noon, you went and you're looking at the sun. So that color you would see. And the fluorescent, two fluorescent had 3,602 Kelvin. So it is the fact that for each situation, you need the proper color temperature. So at night, when you are well, at home and you want to relax, you need uh, warm colors, warm um, colors like uh, around 3000 K. But when you are in an office and you want to work, you need uh, colder colors, uh, say around 4,800. So this choice of LED for the room was not necessarily the best. Would have been better instead of buying a 5,000 uh, K LED or cold, uh, uh, color temperature would have been better to buy a warmer color. So uh, that explained why uh, the people in the house were not happy with the change and uh, eventually these LEDs were replaced with other types. So that's all I have for today's presentation. Thank you very much for listening and uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any questions, please write. You're welcome, Vangelis. Have a nice day. Anyone else has a question? Uh, there is a quiz that you can go ahead and uh, do. Uh, I'll wait for two, three more minutes. If there is any question, you can type it here. Very good presence. Thank you very much, Sonia. Have a great day. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Randy. Have a great day. Anyone else has any questions? Okay, I guess there are no more questions. You can always email me. One more time, I will write my email here. If there are anything, when you do the quiz and if you have any problems, you can feel free to, to, to email me and ask me. And, you know, I'll do my best to answer your questions. AlliedScientificPro.com AlliedScientificPro.com, yes. So you can email me at this. So I would like to thank everyone for listening to this and have a great day. And hopefully we'll have the Photometric Level 3 webinar in uh, maybe probably in two months or so.